Join in your Bibles, Philippians chapter 2, if you would, Philippians chapter 2, and we'll have some of the verses up front. We're going to begin three weeks to honor Christ's church and what that means. And uh, this is Paul's writing to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, and he's very candid with them. Uh, I, when I grew up, I heard often Philippians is the one book without any problems, the one church. It's not true, and Paul's trying to get them to find their joy in Christ and their unity in Christ. Uh, chapter 4, he's very uh, specific about Iodicus and Syntyche. They need to get together and love each other. Iodicus and Syntyche were fighting over whose name is easier to pronounce or something in the church. And, but in Philippians 2, he gives what is the strongest passage about our lives and our care as families and as individuals. So I read the Word of God. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, four phrases, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, whoa, that's verse 1, 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, whoa, having the same love, Being in full accord and of one mind. This is very strong. Three, do nothing from rivalry or conceit. But humility, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Four, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And next week we'll look Where our focus should be, as it it comes up here, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, starting at verse 5. But here he gives these four phrases, which are so strong, he's just said to them, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, here's Paul, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, that's how our unity is, in one spirit, striving together as one, as one body, for the faith of the gospel. So look at your heart and look at what he says. If there's any encouragement in Christ, is the first phrase. I put two on. If there's any encouragement in Christ, if, if, Many writers, some of the commentators I wrote, or I read, uh, said since, say since, but he's, he's challenging them if there's any encouragement in Christ. Encouragement. Do you think, guess what it means to be declared righteous as Jesus Christ in the sight of God when we trust Christ as Savior? Declare righteous, but also indwelled by Spirit, by His Holy Spirit. If there's any encouragement from that, huh? Many of the writers say, why didn't he say since? Because we know it's true. If there's any encouragement, do you get encouragement from Jesus Christ? If you look at His life and what He did for us on the cross, how He lived for us and so unselfishly, and how he brought so much difference to this world. So Paul's like saying, do I have a right to encourage you in Christ? If there, is there anything that comes from your relationship to Jesus Christ? It would almost be like you as parents, or any of us, uh, encouraging our young children. Do you, do you get anything from living in this house? And here it's a spiritual issue. Is there any encouragement from thinking about Christ that actually we stand in God's presence in His mind, righteous, whoa, declared righteous through Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross and the resurrection? Think last week, but think today. Actually, in Colossians, did you know this? It says that in God's mind, hello, we are already risen with Christ and seated with Him in the heavenlies. It's that sure. If there's any encouragement from that, if there's anything you get out of that. And then the second phrase, 
is that if, if there's any comfort from love, and if you're a mother, you want to say, comfort from love. Or any of us in growing up, when somebody hugged us, when, is there any comfort from saying, I love you to each other? Is there any comfort from somebody holding you when you were little? My parents fought and were divorced, and I remember hugs uh, a little bit before that, and then hugs after the pain of that, and from a grandmother who represented Christ in our lives. Is there any comfort from saying, I love you, to someone you live with as married couples and as family? Well, yeah. And he's saying, since this is true, well, I comfort from love, I think of of 62 years of marriage, of 55 years of having children. I think of, of 45 years in a church where people said, I love you regularly, and I too, from the front. I think of God's grace in lives. I've been with 130 churches over the last 15 years, and the comfort that a church receives when they love each other is gigantic. Paul says, is there, is there any of this with you? I, I, it's not sarcasm, but it's, it's like if you said, if, it, if today is my birthday, Don Sanuki, and in his gorgeous book about Philippians, wrote this. He said, if I say to my family, if today's my birthday, if, or he said, I might say, since today's my birthday, I get to choose the restaurant we go to. If, since there's any encouragement in Christ of obeying him and and living for His glory, if there's any comfort for, to know God loves you. I remember as a kid when my parents were fighting, learning John 3.16. Talk about comfort. For God so loved the world, and the teacher would say, put your name in there. Yes, there's comfort in the church from being loved by Christ. Do you feel that? Do you see that as primary? The third one is, any participation in the Holy Spirit? Does He ring in your life, in your conscience? Does the Holy Spirit give you love and comfort and, and confidence when you sing a song about being forgiven by Christ? Participation in the Spirit. I like to think of it as living in combination. Once you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, you no longer live for self, you live in combination. The Bible actually talks about walking in the Spirit. And I used to go, whoa, what does that mean? And I hear a guy on TV who would talk about the Holy Ghost and walking in the Spirit and define it in different ways. It just means that you walk one direction. And the head's in charge. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. And you take one step at a time. What does it mean to walk in the Holy Spirit, who's love and joy and peace? What does it mean? It means that you obey the head, like, like these verses. And that you set the direction of, of unity and of obedience and glorify Christ, which is the only thing that unites this many different people. Glorify Christ, that's your direction, and you take the next step to obey, to ask forgiveness, to, to forgive, to be one in Christ. Paul's laying it on the line for these people and helping them see what it means. One time I was talking at a Christian school assembly, and I, it was grade school, and I asked them about walking in the Spirit, how many steps did the Apostle Paul take at a time when he walked? And you could see their little minds thinking carefully. How many, how many steps at a time did Jesus take when he walked? Uh, there must be some secret answer here. And then one Swedish girl raised her hand in, 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 in row two and said, one I don't know if she's Swedish, but correct answer usually comes from a Swede. And one step, how many steps at a time do you take when you obey Christ? One. It might be a step to forgive or a step to say, my goal in life is to encourage people in Christ to find comfort from His love and, 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 and participate 
in the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace, as he put it another way. Some of you have fought cancer. My mother died of cancer when she was in her mid-40s, a little older 40s. It's horrible to watch. One part of the body eats another part of the one body. And that's what happens in the church when people are not enjoying encouragement and comfort from his love and living, walking, one step, that's all, that's all, one step at a time by the Holy Spirit and obeying, obeying the Bible. When the eclipse happens, I don't know exactly what time it is in Goshen, Elkhart, uh, you can look it up. It's only because God has a system. He didn't just say, go earth, whatever you wish, or sun, or orbits, or this vast billions and billions of light years of universe. He sets it all in place. He has a way for the church to live. And he wants us to participate in the Spirit. The fourth one is, if there's any affection and sympathy, compassion is the word sympathy. If you're married, is there any affection and compassion? for? Oh, yeah, that's why you commit to each other. And it's oneness in Christ that helps us in the church. And Paul's saying, he really means sense. Come on, you guys, if there's anything to this thing, you've got to model this as in family. And the one thing that makes all this true, our, our compassion, our oneness, is we lived in the church to glorify Jesus Christ. We could fight about music. We could fight about anything in the church or the last email. One thing that unites us is the bond to glorify the Savior. Is that you? Is that what you want in your deepest heart as a kid or as an adult or all of us as veterans? He said, if any of these things are true, one writer said, we all grow up living for me. I was selfish when I was little. I learned to say the first four-letter word you ever said, mine. We say it automatically as a kid. I thought our kids were not going to have a sin nature. And then I remember the first lie the one daughter told. Huh? It's part, how do you turn the me, you turn it upside down, the writer said. It's we, it's the church, it's the body of Christ, which never has the cancer of attacking one other parts of the body. It's one, Paul said, if this is true, in Jesus Christ, and he knows it's true, and he wants them to honor it. Do you want that to be true? It needs to be true in our personal lives. Paul, Paul wrote in, in, in Romans, in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. One time I got an email, Janine and I were at the chapel in Akron, twenty. 26 years, wonderful years. And I got an email. You get all kinds of emails from a lot of people. And the guy said, why do you always look at the screen on your left? So the next Sunday, I walked over there. I tried. I had to remember. I don't know why. And if it bothers you, I'm very sorry. <laughs> but if there's any comfort from the... If there's any... Anyway... So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs. How is this going to work? Same way it works in the body. We obey the head. And in the case of the church, it's Christ and his love and his unity. So in Christ, we are many. How do you picture what Jesus did? When he died on the cross, all of your sins, including selfishness, mine, were put on his back. He cried out, it is finished. When I believe in him, that counts for me. 
so many people say, well, I hope I'll go to heaven. 75% of people on a Gallup poll last summer said they would go to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments. Hello. No one has ever kept the Ten Commandments except Jesus. When we put our faith in Him and His death for our sins, is that you? It counts for you. It is finished means it is paid for. Whoa. What's more, when you put your faith in Christ, His righteousness covers you. His righteousness is the way God sees me and you. And then we're to live like that as we obey Him. And the one thing that can unite us is not that we agree on everything, but that we want to glorify Jesus Christ and have His grace in our lives. So Paul's saying this, the closer you get to Christ, the closer to each other in purpose. If it's true, or I'd say so clearly to me and to you, it, since it's true, then here's his command in the next verse. Sometimes I push too hard. Let's go back to this. Be one or united. Listen to verse 2. It's, it's all so clear. Complete my joy. Paul has already urged him to make him joyful. He's in prison. He's, he knows he's going to die for his commitment to Christ. Complete my joy by being of the same mind. Whoa. Having the same love. Huh? being in full accord and of one mind. I tell you, the one thing that unites us is that we have the same goal to glorify Jesus Christ. And it's not easy. Selfish sinner that I am, I easily want to do it my way. In the Mark series, we looked at the transfiguration and Peter, James, and John, weak disciples like me and you, are taken by Jesus to the top of this mountain, they fall asleep first, to, to be shown the glory of Jesus Christ, and he sparkles with deity and with holiness. His garments turn, have you read it recently? Mark it says it so clearly in, in three Gospels. They turn bright white, and he shines as the full deity that he is. And that appears with him two of the prophets from the Old Testament. And on the way down, in the same chapter in one gospel, they're arguing as to which of them is the greatest. Huh? How human can we be? They have just seen the glory of the risen Christ, the, the, his full deity, and it's preparing them for his death and resurrection and obedience. But on the way down, as to which of them is the greatest. Oh, people can be so selfish. I can be. Make it your goal in life as a church and as an individual. The joy of unity comes not with thinking the same about everything or exact same opinions, but being united in Christ and wanting to glorify Him. It's almost like the body will never work together, and if cancer hits or the nerve system breaks down, it doesn't work right. But when we obey the head and do what the head tells it. That's the church. That's what he means it to be. And the harmony of purpose is so clear here. In verse 2, he just says it. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. You agree. What's the agreement? We're here to honor Christ and to glorify Him as Lord. 
I always go back to a, a, a doctor on the airplane who, who said to me when she saw me reading the Bible, and I asked her if she believed that, she said, a famous quote that's all around the country these days, truth is whatever you believe for yourself, that becomes truth for you. Truth is whatever you believe, that becomes your truth. I said, do you practice that in medicine? She said, well, of course not. And I did say, I wasn't being smart, Alec, honest. I was knowing I'm going to have to speak on this here at this church. No, I wasn't. <laughs> I said, do you hope the pilot practices that? You know, I don't know how to fly a plane, but whatever I believe becomes truth for me. She said, honest, I'm off this plane. And yet she believes that when it comes to doctrine. No, truth is obeying Jesus Christ and honoring him as Lord of the church. And that's the main thing that unites us. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul said to the church, you're one body. No part of the body argues against the other part or goes after it. It, it obeys the head. That's what he wants from our church. And Paul is trying to stop the divisions at Philippi and in any of our hearts. So be one and united. He had started this letter so clearly, grace and peace. Those, are, those, are, those belong to the church. They're exactly what he wants me to have in my life. Grace and peace to you from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Before he ever asked them to, come on, be united, to honor Christ. He said, I thank God every time I remember you. He's not trying to bawl them out or scold them. He's trying to say, look what you have. And he said, I love you. That's what he's trying to say. No matter how big the church or wherever you sit in the church, he said, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. And all of that is his sincere heart, but it's also to help them, please obey, be united, if you are one in Christ. Is that you? Is that what you want more than your own way? It's what a church can be in Christ. He, he goes on in verse 4 to give, and I'll just call it humble and unselfish, verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Did you watch any of the final four? I hope you didn't watch the second game or you're sleeping right now. But those are amazing teams. And the goal of the team is not to see, not to see who can individually stand out. Their coaches won't allow that. It's to, to win, to be together as a team. And here Paul says, humility means you set a pick for the other guy. You help somebody else get a basket. You, you rebound and get it to the, to the shooter. You're unselfish in the church. You do it for the glory of Christ. I, I think back to the great encouragement when a church stands together and loves together, and the greatest encouragements I could hear not, were not an uh, okay sermon or, or good job on this. It was, I pray for you, or tell me how I can help. It's united in Christ. And here he says, verse 4 again, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. There is nothing more beautiful than a family that loves each other. There is nothing more beautiful than a church that loves each other. And doesn't it try to agree on everything or to have a thousand people in charge? It's to honor Jesus Christ as the head and to find our closeness to each other 
in the one purpose, to glorify Christ and do what He would do. Obeying His great command to love and His great commission to the world. Is that you? In your heart, do you, do you find any courage and any comfort and any sympathy with Jesus Christ and with His desire that together we honor Him as head of the church and as Lord of salvation and eternal life and the way we live? Obeying the head one step at a time in the right direction. We must make those steps. And there's nothing more beautiful than we do that together. Paul writes this, and then he goes on to say, I'll tell you what you should be like. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And next week we'll look at those verses. But that's the kind of mind that he wants in the church. There is nothing more beautiful than when people work together. That's an actual picture from nature. I took it from behind a bush with my iPhone. I don't know. I think it's to say to the church, now you do this also. You serve together for one, one main reason, not to get your way, but to honor Jesus Christ as Lord. To glorify Him is the one thing that can unite everybody who would split over music, over things that are dividing the church all over the world today, but can be one when we honor Him as Jesus the Christ. I often tell the story from my favorite book or movie, Chariots of Fire. It was a true story. It is a true story. Eric Liddell was a, a runner, and a, he'd be, he would become a missionary, a fine follower of Jesus, become a missionary in China, died in a prison camp in China. But in his young days in school, he was a runner and would run in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. I was there. I saw him do this. <laughs> 1924, Eric Liddell, a second runner, the story was about both of them, is Harold Linzel. I say it carefully, but Harold Linzel, by the book, ran for Harold Linzel. They both won a gold in two different races at the 1924 Olympics. When Eric Liddell won the gold, he laughed. He worshipped. They hoisted him on their shoulders. It's a beautiful picture in the movie and the book. And he's looking up to the heavens and giving God thanks and giving him glory. When Harold Abrams won gold in another race, he ran for Harold Abrams. He didn't know what to do with the gold. And the book and the movie show him at a Paris cafe drinking beer and getting drunk. He doesn't know how to... What do you do at the end of your life if you've lived for yourself? Not much. And Harold uh, Abrams turned to his coach, forgive my language, and his coach says to him, Harold, who cares? The whole world can go to hell. Tell them you won for you and old Sam Musabini, and, that all that, and that's all that matters. Harold Abrams takes another sip of beer. It is not enough to live for yourself. It is not enough for me to want me to shine. The way to give glory to God is to live for Him and obey Him. What brings a church together in unity is to give God the glory through His Son, Jesus Christ, and our obedience to Him is what he wants, is what God wants from every one of us, starting with me and you. And at the end of time, we'll give him glory. 
will sing. It is good to find your unity in Jesus Christ and your main goal to glorify Him. Let's pray. Lord, help me to do that. Please help us to do that. Please, by your kind and Holy Spirit, unite our hearts to fear your name and honor Jesus Christ. As you pray, if you would, make that your motive, your your goal in this church, to honor him. It's the one thing that can unite us in Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you who are strong in our lives, strong will bring a stronger unity to our church, to our campuses, and to our personal hearts, please. If you've never put your faith in Christ, you don't, you don't get the idea of forgiveness and gifted righteousness through Christ, please ask God's help to talk to someone. Talk to me, talk to someone on staff, talk to a friend. And live with Christ in your life. Thank you, Lord. We pray that this will be true in my life, in all of our lives, in the staff, in the board, and in all the church. Please, give us this kind of unity in Christ our Savior, the Mighty One. Save our lives, please. Amen.